Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Patrick Kinney. I'm the Beverly Brown Professor of Urban Health and Environmental Health at BU School of Public Health. Um, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our second keynote speaker for today's event, Dr. Francesca Domenici. Dr. Domenici is the co-director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative at Harvard University and the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Biostatistics, Population and Data Science at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and of the International Society of Mathematical Statistics. At Harvard, she leads an interdisciplinary group of scientists with the ultimate goal of addressing important questions in environmental health science, climate change, and biomedical science. And on a personal note, I first became aware of Francesca's work in the late 1990s when she was a doctoral student at Johns Hopkins working in collaboration with uh, Scott Zeger and John Samet. Um, on some really groundbreaking air pollution epidemiologic uh, studies that um, took, took the science to a new level by, by looking uh, across the entire United States at data and combining data in a really in, like in, impressive tour de force. And I think that kind of characterizes the, the work, at least in the air pollution uh, domain that I've, I've seen coming out of Francesca's group over the intervening 20 years or so. So anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to Francesca and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me. I feel like um, you guys are my next door neighbor and been knowing you, Pat, for a long time and as well as Greg. So um, it's really my, my, my pleasure to um, talk about the work that I've been doing really in collaboration with an amazing group of students and postdoctoral fellows and together and joined with uh, BU School of Public Health. So what I'll be talking about is really how we're gonna address the health effect of climate change and vulnerability and really where, where is the science going? So I like to start with my key points. So then if you wanted to enjoy the good weather for the next 25 minutes, you can. Um, but let me just tell you, so, you know, exactly what are be the key, going to be the key points of this presentation. So first of all, well, I am a data scientist, a passionate statistician, and so this is going to be very much a data science perspective on the issues of climate change and health. I really, I am, you know, really excited and enthusiastic about the fact that now we have new data, satellite data, atmospheric chemistry models, and machine learning models they allow us to, to measure climate change related exposure with unprecedented pre precision. Our methods for causal inference allow us to estimate health impacts from climate change related exposure and identify the most vulnerable. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. And then you know, just to add the importance of looking at this issue, there is now emerging evidence of a link between air pollution, wildfires, and uh, COVID-19. So first of all, let me say that this is really an important message that many of you might know. And it's the fact that climate change and air pollution share the same sources. So basically you can see the road traffic industry buildings are the same sources for greenhouse gas emission and PM 2.5. What it means is that if we pass a regulation that regulate PM 2.5, not only we are breathing clean air now, which means better health now, we are also combating climate change. And this is really an important point because actually within the framework of data science, so data science I think has been extremely successful in um, leading to more stringent regulation for ambient level of fine particulate matter. As you can see in the, in the plot on your left, these are the national ambient, uh, sorry, these are the level of the primary air pollutants in the hair and how they've been declining steadily um, over time. And on the right, you can see a much cleaner skyline. How this has happened? This has happened thanks to the Cleaner Act where over the last 25 years, there has been reviewed, the EPA routinely reviewed the evidence of whether or not the current level of uh, fine particulate matter uh, affect human health. And if the levels at which they're below the national safety standard are affecting human health, then they have to lower the current standards. So good news is that very recently, uh, recently as last, uh, uh, the last few months, 
the WHO has passed to reduce the regulation and, the, and to, re, to reduce, sorry, not to reduce the regulation, to reduce the safety level of fine particulate matter to fine to five um, microgram per cubic meter. And so this is really important for our conversation because effort to carb pollution by reducing fossil fuel use will provide a double benefit, both improving public health and also bringing down climate warming emissions. Are they showing now? Oh, there we go. Yes, we can see them now. Okay, I'll, I'll start from here. I'm so sorry. Okay. No, no worries. Thank you so much. That's okay. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you told me. Okay, so um, what I was going to say is that the, um, the national ambient, so the one of my major focus, so by the way, it's perfectly fine because everything I said was not, nothing particularly important to look on the slides. So we, we can basically just start from now. So one of my passion and my interest is actually on combining and creating large national data platforms um, for assessing the health impact of climate change. And that is a really important uh, task. And so one of my goal, and really one of my important aspects of my research has been to take health data, socioeconomic data, and climate change related exposure data and linking together in a major national platform. So we have been building again together, and I will talk more about at the end of the presentation, together with many of my colleagues, a national data platform where basically we gather data on ambient level of air pollution, climate change related exposure like uh, wildfires, hurricane, uh, tropical cyclones, heat, heat weight, a heat warning system, uh, we link to claims data from Medicare and Medicaid, but also, as I'm going to show you, to my colleague, to the Optum data on, 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 on um, also medical record for uh, people also younger than 65, and to the National Center of Health Statistics, and then many other socioeconomic variables. So by, by bringing a lot of data sources together, we can really monitor the health impact of climate change and assess vulnerability and susceptibility. So one aspect which I think is in a very exciting area of research uh, that I think now multiple group around the United States are really tackling is our ability to take satellite data and output from atmospheric chemistry model together with machine learning to be able to predict at a high level of accuracy exposure to environmental contaminant. Not only exposure to fine particulate matter, as I'm showing in this slide, but also to the chemical component to, of fine particulate matter, to emission sources. And now we're doing with wildfires and many other climate change, drought, for example. So there was a study that we published um, less than two years ago, uh, led by Zhao, a former uh, student of mine, and uh, um, Danielle Brown, a senior research scientist in my team, where for the first time we evaluated the long-term exposure to fine particulate matter of mortality among the elderly. This was a massive study that we wanted to do as a follow-up of another previous study, where it was really important to, to develop a methodology for causal inferences. So then we could better disentangle the fact of fine particular matter of mortality compared to uh, other potential confounders. This was a study of over 68 million uh, Medicare and really they were over 65, um, pretty much all over the United States, over 31,000 zip code. Um, to give you a sense, basically we had over 30 million Medicare release that were exposed of fine, uh, levels of fine particular matter below 12 microgram per cubic meter. 12 microgram per cubic meter are currently the safety standard for the, um, for the, the United States. So we have a, a unique really patient idea. We can follow them um, over time. So over 537 million observation. So just thinking about this, this um, national research data platform. So that is really the health data. Uh, and then we linked it to PM 2.5 exposure prediction from machine learning model, a one kilometer, one kilometer resolution for all the United States. We have a health, we have weather data, we have census data, 
we have CDC data. And so this is why having a gigantic and rich and stable data platform is so important because you can layer additional type of data and start interrogating this data for climate change related health impact. The other important aspect, which I'm going to tell you a little bit later on, is the importance of developing the best possible statistical methodology. And this contest in causal inference. Why we need causal inference? The, the advantage of causal inference when you are analyzing this large observational data is the ability to better try to approximate a randomized study by using observational data. And you can do that by actually doing some visual check and see whether or not after you have matched the individuals with high and low exposure with respect to all of their potential confounders, you're really breaking the correlation and the potential confounding effect of the, of the exposure, in this case, air pollution, but similar cases with climate change related exposure and health impact. What this picture shows uh, on the left are the national average estimates of the percentage increase in all-cause mortality for 10 unit increase in fine particulate matter using five different statistical methods. A Cox proportional hazard model, which is basically the, the kind of like the standard approach that everybody does. They analyze data at the individual level and is enormously computational expensive, especially when you're dealing with, with several hundred million observations. A Poisson approximation that you can see provide very similar results. And then three methods for causal inference uh, that use exact matching with the propensity score, adjustment by the propensity score, and many other approaches that we also have developed. You can see the results are very consistent. However, when we analyze the data only for people that always expose a level below 12 microgram per cubic meter. And so these are the ones that we shouldn't see any adverse health effect if the standard were lower enough. Um, we seek two important messages. One is actually that health impact and the uh, health effect on mortality is actually higher, okay? And two is that the method for causal inference, although shows a positive a statistical significant relationship between exposure to PM 2.5 below the standard and a percentage increase in all-cause mortality are a little lower than the standard method. So that really means that sometimes the use, the use of causal inference method allow us a better adjustment for, um, for, for confounding. We found in this study that lowering their quality standard from 12 to 10 will save 143,000 lives. So we really hope that this study, which is also reproducible using method for causal inference is hoping and playing an important role as the national ambient air quality standard for PM 2.5 are under discussion these days. And again, remember, if we lower the national ambient air quality standard for PM 2.5, we target the same sources for greenhouse gases emission. There is impressive work done by my junior colleague, student and postdoctoral fellow, with the idea also of estimating an exposure response function. And it's very important to estimate an exposure response function between climate change related exposure and health outcome in a way that is as flexible as possible to see whether or not there is a threshold or there is a lower level in this context for fine particular matter below which there is not. Uh, in effect, you can see that the exposure response function and the shape for PM 2.5 is close to be linear. So switching gear of going to 0.5 into exposure, they are really more directly, I think, now attributable to climate change. I want to mention some of the very recent work of, that I've been able to do with my colleague or um, in, 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 in this context. One is the tropical cyclone and hurricanes. There was this really fantastic work led by Robbie Parks, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Columbia with Marianti, um, who is an associate professor of environmental, environmental health. They took um, cost-specific mortality data by the National Center of Health Statistics. They linked to it uh, a pretty sophisticated approach for estimating county level exposure to tropical cyclones and many other confounding factors. And again, this goes back to the importance of building this national platform where you can link different sources of data together. And uh, um, this, this, this study was published only uh, in 
last week, March 8th, and actually was a commentary by uh, Dean uh, Sandro Galea and colleagues on, on this important work. And I think what's important here is uh, what, what, you know, I, I was partially and marginally part of, of this work. I, I want to brag about it for several reasons. One is they look at cost-specific mortality, which was really important. Two, they also were able to examine lagged exposure. So they will be able to look at whether um, one additional cyclone day per month was associated with an increased mortality for different causes up to several months later, right? And so you can see that was, I thought it was interesting and fascinating that we don't see much effect on tropical cyclone and hurricanes on cancer specific mortality and a little bit of cardiovascular for mortality for the first couple of months, but definitely you see an effect on infections, uh, infectious and parasitic disease, definitely big effect on like zero injuries that will be expected, but also on neuropsychiatric conditions and respiratory, um, and respiratory disease. Another really important um, climate change related exposure is heat. Uh, and so it is really important in terms of assessing um, the, the health impact. And there is a fantastic collaboration that I am delighted and honored to have with actually uh, many of the faculty at, at BU, um, where uh, the goal is to link different data sources. In this context, uh, through Greg Wallenius, they were able to access the Optum data set. And the Optum provide electronic medical record and hospital-specific, um, cost-specific hospitalization, not only for the elderly, as the only Medicare data, but also for people younger uh, than 65. So this was a really fantastic study um, led by my friend and colleague, um, Amruta, and where I thought that really the important message and important element of this study is really to look at mental health. And like we all know that actually now with intersection between the climate change related disaster and COVID and everything else that is really affecting the, the world is uh, mental health are really an important element. So again, this is another beautiful example where we are building and gaining knowledge by linking and analyzing data in a very sophisticated manner. So what um, um, Amruda did, they, she linked um, she linked uh, medical data from the optimum at county level with uh, weather data and looking special, specifically at stream temperature. And you can see she found a very strong relationship between the increase in ambient temperature and incidence rate ratio for uh, any mental health condition. It's important here to notice, and this is something that really captured my attention, for example, that there is an incidence rate ratio of 1.11, so an 11% for childhood onset behavioral disorder where you are comparing a, the 95 percentile of local warm season daily temperature with respect to the optimal optimal temperature. So that is really another very important element of research that we can do and we can do better if we are supported by sophisticated data, data science. So the other element, and I think the other very interesting research pro program that I've been able to learn and enjoy in collaboration with my colleague Abiu, um, is really to looking at the health impact of heat warning system. So when, again, when we are dealing with protecting our health with climate change related disaster. So what type of intervention work? What can we do? So Kate, uh, Kate Weinberger, who uh, is a member of the, the, the team in the lab with Greg Wallenius, so she's been conducting a very successful research of looking at the health impact of heat alert system. And quite disappointing, um, we found, she found uh, in this really interesting work that heat alert were actually not very effective in lowering the risk of, of death. Were somewhat effective in lowering the risk of hospitalization for heat stroke. Um, and, but, you know, again, there was not really, um, they, 
uh, actually, I'm sorry, let me say it back. No, not they were effective, they were the opposite. They were associated with a higher risk of hospitalization and um, heat stroke. So basically what's going on here? So are these really heat alerts not uh, useful and actually could be harmful? And so this is part of a really a, a very interesting investigation that is led by Zhao, who uh, again was, you know, as a member of the of the team led by Greg Wallenius on a, on a joint grant that we have together, which is really try to address from a causal inference perspective, how many deaths we could have been avoided if we change the frequency of heat alert. So actually this is in the context of really data science and causal inference is in the context of what we call stochastic intervention. By stochastic intervention, what we need, what we mean about is really an hypothetical intervention. So basically what, I, what we wanna answer the question is, how much more often do we need to, to, uh, to increase the number of heat um, issue I need to alert to see a protective effect on health. So Zhao is, is leading a paper where basically, you, you, I can just show it, it's highly technical and I can show you with data, right? So basically what this picture shows, so these are the heat uh, the, in, um, with the um, blue uh, cross are identified days where they were issued heat alert in Los Angeles County during the period 2006 and 2016. And so what um, Zhao is doing within a highly rigorous causal inference framework and a stochastic intervention is asking the question, okay, now if we think different counterfactual, so different hypot alternative hypothetical scenario where we increase the number of heat warning, how, how are we going to see a health impact? So this is a, like an hypothetical counterfactual where you see that you know the number of days where we are um, issuing an alert is much more frequent. And what is finding, for example, when it does a county specific analysis for all many different counties in the United States, then some counties so this heat warning alert can be more effective than others. So for example, in the Maricopa County in Arizona, we need to if we um, increase the frequency of it uh, 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 alert substantially uh, up to an odds ratio of two, you see that you start seeing a, um, a positive effect on preventing number of deaths. That would be much less effective in New York. And that is really important because it not only to address the question, how many more heat alert do we have to have, but also that as we all know, there is a differential heterogeneity vulnerability across the United States in our ability to respond to this heat warning system. One more topic I wanna to talk about is the one of wildfires. And the reason now I've been uh, very passionate and interested in looking at um, the health impact of wildfires and really to think about the entire computational pipeline of wildfires. So one, one aspect would be how do we best estimate exposure to wildfires, considering that we are not directly monitoring the level of PM2.5 that is a directly attributable to, to, uh, to PM2.5. And then how we estimate the impact on, on health, and especially in the context of a COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, last uh, summer 2020, we were really interested to look at the intersection of the health impact of, of the wildfires and the COVID-19 pandemic. So we all know that in summer 2020, there were two things happening simultaneously, extreme wildfires and COVID-19. Um, COVID so we work on, on, on this study led by Zhao Danzu, which actually this is in collaboration with ASRI, the Environmental Science Research Institute. It's a fantastic data science company and data visualization. And Zhao Dan um, joined us on this effort and, and co-led this effort with Kevin Joyce, who's a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. And so really we wanted to, to look at how many more excess COVID-19, how many more cases and deaths for COVID-19 we were going to observe that were attributable to the wildfire exposure during the summer 2020 for all of the counties um, in uh, the west part in the United States, California, um, uh, Oregon, and Washington State. 
So we harness again goes back to enriching this national data platform. We got all public available data on daily levels of fine particulate matter for these 92 counties. Again, during the summer, like from April to November 2020. Um, then we have a daily number of COVID-19 deaths, daily number of COVID-19 cases. You can see on the orange line where the estimated wildfire days that we obtain by looking at satellite information. And so you can notice it, for example, that during the wildfire days, the level of PM 2.5 gets really, really high, right? So we built a start statistical model and machine learning model to be able to look for each county and overall for all the counties, what was the relationship between daily changes in PM 2.5 attributable to wildfires and excess number of COVID-19 cases and that's up to a month after that the wildfires has occurred. So that requires some thinking with respect to also thinking about counterfactual time series analysis in terms of trying to estimate what is the PM 2.5 that is really attributable to wildfires, right? So there is also, this is again, another really exciting area that many, many people, um, they are, they're working on it and really thinking about attribution. So in a very simple and in a data science oriented way, this is what we did. So the blue dots are the daily level of fine particular matter in Los Angeles County during that summer. The orange, as I mentioned before, are the days that we know that wildfires occur by, by taking information from federal information from satellite data. And so you can see, for example, that for these days, right, the, 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 the PM 2.5 is really coming up really high, right, during these wildfires. Now, how do we how do we measure the level of PM 2.5 attributable to wildfire? Well, we take historical data. So we take the, day, the, the average level of fine particulate matter for all of the previous years, no, excluding the years that were affected by wildfires. And so that is the, the dark line, the dark time series. And then we took the the, the difference, right? So the diff, so the level, the observed level of PM 2.5 during the wildfire day and the historical level of PM 2.5, knowing that during this historical year, wildfires has not been occurred, give us an estimate of the excess PM 2.5 attributable to wildfires. So this is a sum of the results that shows that for every, for each of the 90, five counties in the United States, the relationship between exposure to PM 2.5 from wildfire and excess number of cases and deaths for COVID-19. On the left are the cases and on the right are the deaths. The overall estimates, so you can see it's a little in red, is positive and, and, and statistical significant. For some counties, the effect was, was huge. So for example, in, in Sonoma County, California, we found that if you take 10 units increase in fine particular matter attributable to wildfire day, could lead up to a 56% increase in COVID-19 cases up to a, to a month later. The wonderful things of collaborating with, with ESRI, which by the way, they were responsible for creating the data platform and the data visualization for COVID-19 for all the, for, for all, for all, actually not only for all the continental United States, all the world, is really the really important data visualization that can be shared with local public health agency. So we uh, build this, uh, this uh, uh, platform and again, all data and all of the code and the platform, everything is publicly available by linking it to the paper. And so for example, what you can see is that you can click on each of the 95 counties. So this one is an example where we click on Fresno County. And on Fresno, you can see the ambient level of fine particular matter in yellow, the level of fine particular matter that were attributable at the wildfire that happened in, uh, in Fresno. This is the COVID-19 daily cases. Uh, you can see the level of PM 2.5 on wildfire days, so the level of PM 2.5 during the non-wildfire days. And in, uh, in uh, Fresno, we found uh, 1,628 extra cases. Um, attributable to wildfires and extra 131, um, 31 deaths. So I want to spend the last few minutes to really wrap up and really thinking about what's behind all of this. And, and behind all of this, there is really an important to think about statistical rigor because we are 
analyzing data that have been collected for different purposes. So these are observational data. These are not well-designed cohort studies. And so in one hand, it's fantastic because we have the opportunity to leverage a lot of external data sources. On the other hand, we have to be extremely careful that our conclusions are valid. So there are so many unresolved data science challenges that we are tackling together. And I think that's really also an exciting aspect of, of this work. So first of all, it's really how we quantify uncertainty and propagate uncertainty. So often if we are estimating the climate change related exposure, right? So if we are estimating how much pollution we are breathing or how much um, expose how much we are exposed to hurricane, for example. Well, we also need to propagate this uncertainty into the health effect estimates. There is really an increased attention to think about and leveraging the very successful and still, of course, um, very pro productive field of causal inference. So to really think rigorously of how we make conclusion about the studies. And when we say, and when we attribute climate change exposure to greenhouse gases or, or a health impact to climate change exposure, are we really making some causal statement and how we deal with a measure of confounding, how we estimate the exposure response function that actually can have a causal inference in interpretation. And really importantly, which I'm gonna mention in a second, is really the important to be very data-driven in understanding vulnerability. Vulnerability, as we all know, is really important because if we had, can identify the communities based on socioeconomic status, based on race, based on location, based on a compounded effect on multiple environmental stressors, we can act in a more effective way. And then it's really the importance of building reproducible pipelines so then we share our research and we all collectively contribute to for addressing this important problem. So there is a tremendous amount of work uh, led mostly by the student and postdoctoral fellow on really thinking about statistical methodology in causal inference and machine learning in the space of climate change um, and health. These are just some snapshot of several of really important productive, uh, productive work. One thing I want to flag is really this Work that is led by postdoctoral fellow in my team, Marco Bargali, Stoffi, and Daniela Garcia, who is a college student at Harvard, which is really thinking about uh, machine learning to be able to identify um, to identify subgroup of the population that will be more or less um, susceptible to climate change related exposure. And so basically what they are building, and this is a really hopefully at a delayed stage of publication, including the software, these are really learning by, uh, instead of saying, instead of trying to ask, are the elderly more susceptible or are the people with socioeconomic status more susceptible? It's really looking at the data that fortunately we have a lot and really identifying these um, sub, subgroup that might be characterized by a constellation of factors that they are occurring, uh, occurring to, to, together. So I think this is really something that I'm really proud of the work they're leading. Again, I think to go back to the, this field of precision public health, where we can really identify community with high precision that will be the most susceptible to these climate change related exposure and intervene in a targeted fashion. So um, reproducibility is paramount to, to me for scientific rigor and whatever possible be able to share the data and the code really I feel is the perfect training uh, for, for our student, but it's really the perfect and the most um, effective way to really increase scientific rigor. And I'm so glad I have Nahim um, as a software engineer in the team that is really helping us with really understanding re, re, reproducible in climate change and health. So I just want to conclude by thanking everybody because the work uh, that I'm talking is really the results of an amazing 
community. We now have, I will call it a consortium of PI from different from, from different institutions, of course, including, including BU. So we have created actually the pandemic in a certain way and forcing us to transition online and through base camp, we have created a wonderful community of postdoctoral fellow student, master student, and undergraduate student. So I just want to show you some of the many uh, really young and enthusiastic faces that have been contributing um, enormously to all of the work that I've been uh, sharing with you all. So I'm going to conclude, and I'm happy to take any question. And I'm sorry for skipping for skipping the first five, five, five slides, but you didn't miss much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for that um, really uh, stimulating and uh, impressive talk and uh, covering a wide range of topics from uh, particulate matter, heat, storms, wildfire, and others. Um, and it, it's interesting if, for those who have been able to stay with us throughout the entire uh, conference today to see the range of spatial scales that have been covered. We've heard about work from the neighborhood scale all the way up to the national scale. And in particular here at the end in your talk, um, uh, the, the, the impressive national scale analyses. I was wondering if, if, you, could, if you could speak, Francesca, to the, the unique sort of value of those large scale analyses in contrast maybe to the sort of community scale work that, that's also important. What is it that the large scale analyses really contribute? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I think that, you know, first of all, let me say, I do think that we need both because community level and really um, small spatial scale. So let, let's say, for example, a highly detailed study, which I know actually, um, you know, Jonathan Levy has been doing around, be, you know, around Boston, right, when we are really having going really close to a census tract level and be able to pin down specific census tract that, for example, may be more or less vulnerable to heat or COVID. So they have the, they, I would say, the value that um, exposure assessment when is, a, is a certain at the small spatial resolution is more precise, right? So I think that, so that's why I do think that we definitely need a study because in addition, also being able to have a more deep engagement also with the community. So I, I think that that is a work that it's paramount and need to continue because we need to see and, and study this phenomena both at the micro level and at the micro level. This national study, I think they have um, so first of all, let me say immediately what's the disadvantages. So the disadvantage, as you can imagine, right? So the, the PM 2.5, I think, is the best as we can in terms of that we get a resolution of one kilometer, one kilometer grid, and the Medicare claims are the zip code. But many of the other study, unfortunately, the National Center of Health Statistics is only available, you know, the health data is only available at county level, the hurricane is only available at county level. So we you have, you know, misclassification of exposure. I think the advantage is, I think, for policy, I think saying that we are doing this at the national level, and so thinking that you are studying the entire nation and have more representativeness of the study population, I think it's attractive. And it's also, I think, attractive in terms, again, to see at the highest, at the uh, very high level, vulnerability, right? Because again, in the Boston area, as well, as long, uh, you know, we all know that there is different vulnerability, different socioeconomic status uh, within the Boston area, but it's never gonna cover the national range, right? So I think that, you know, just to say, I don't think that we should, you know, have never like a prioritization. I think that there is a complementary, and I feel that actually the best science for doing this will be to, really do almost a nested study where you have, let's say for example, for, for the cyclone, that we have a national study, but then you look within some of the community within the national study and try to better un un understand. The other thing that we are doing, that that's also why 
I would say some time in the methodology and statistics that I'm so passionate can be very helpful, is that combining different, different sources, so then you can overcome the bias going from a high spatial resolution to a smaller spatial resolution. So there is a work that we are developing in really thinking about, okay, now you have a very detailed study in one area where your spatial resolution is very small, how you generalize and how you borrow information from that to try to correct this, the spatial misalignment or the misclassification on the exposure that you have on a national study. So more and more work to do, but, um, you know, I think, I think micro and micro should really go hand by hand moving forward. Thank you so much for that that really uh, thorough and, and nuanced uh, response. I think I think you raised some really important points. And you know your your point about the policy relevance of the large scale work is really well taken. I, you know, having participated in the standard setting process for PM two point five, I've seen how influential the national scale work really is. You know, I, even the original NMAPS work from your doctoral studies, but then more recently the the Medicaid work at the Medicare work at the national scale has been really has been really sort of central in sort of deciding what what the standard ought to be. So that's really a good point. Um, another another so I'm going to ask another question or two, and then we'll turn it over to the audience uh, questions. Um, you started off uh, very appropriately pointing out the 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 way that air pollution and climate change are so intimately connected uh, from the source point of view and. Um, you know, but then if we look at, you know, we've been so successful in the United States at cleaning up the air pollution, um, you know, even for PM 2.5, although, although I, as you show, it's still not healthy, but it's, we, it's come down a lot. But, you know, we haven't done very much for CO2 reduction. So can you think of, are there ways that we, we ought to do a better job from a policy point of view of, of linking these two objectives? Because as you say, they, they come from the same sources, but I guess the control methods are not exactly the same. So could you speak about that? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, I mean, so yes, I think I think there is so much more work that we need to do. And so I think um, it's really important to well, there are there are a couple a couple of, of points. One is we are still going to regulate um total pm 2.5 mass and i think that regulating continue to regulate total pm 2.5 mass although um from you know from a public health expert we all want to happen um it can not be completely effective into um combating climate change and greenhouse gases emission without understanding the sources of pm 2.5 that they're most harmful so i think that there is now again and that's why you know, even though, of course, by no means I'm an expert in atmospheric chemistry model, I see how atmospheric chemistry models supplemented by new uh, imaginary and satellite and sensor can really try to help us to disentangle the source of PM 2.5 that are most harmful. By identifying that, I do think that we can be more effective into controlling the greenhouse gases emission that they are also more harmful. So, you know, I, I don't have the uh, billion dollar answer in terms of what we should do, but I do think that from a scientific perspective, we, we cannot stop on PM 2.5 total mass. And I do think that now we have the tool and the data to go deeper than that, and therefore to also better assess and try to regulate things that are more directly linked to uh, greenhouse gases emission. There is work now that it's looking directly, for example, at emission from coal fire power plants and emission from fracking sites, right? So I think that's, um, we have been looking at PM 2.5 and obsessed about PM 2.5, I think for good reason, but I do think that it's time to move on and thinking about other type of climate change related exposure. What are the primary driver? Oh yeah, very, very good point. Um, and that's actually a good segue to another question I had, which is, you know, given the range of the climate related health pathways that you've been studying in your research in recent years, what are what's the one or two that you're most excited about continuing, or or are there new directions on the climate health, um, you know, pathway that that you think are really important for the re your your future research? Yeah, that's that's a great point. So first of all, it's interesting because I I think that 
you know, the work that, that we have been doing and also in collaboration with you guys and with Greg, and uh, we had such amazing, enthusiastic and productive group that there have been so many papers coming out recently from the group that even myself, I had the time to just like digest. Because <laughs> so the Aura came paper came up on March 8th and uh, the work that Greg has been leading on heat wave uh, came up just a couple of months ago. So, I mean, all of the work I presented today, actually, if you think about it, it's just been coming up in the last year, right? So I haven't really had the time actually to think about it. Um, but so I think that there are, but one element I'm really excited about. It. And so, so, so actually, this is, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because that's really make, make me to reflect. So what, what actually what I've been trying to do in, in all of this and just really in the last couple of years, as we realize how much work that we can do, I've been really try to be the one behind the scene and facilitate and enable junior faculty and postdoctoral fellow to really start interrogating these, these, these data, right? And I think this is now becoming a time to really pause and reflect and to think about research strategy and, and priority. So, but what to quickly address your question, one thing I'm excited though, is really the aspect of vulnerability. Because I think, so in one hand, we need to continue to document the health impact, short and long-term health impact of this climate change related exposure and do attribution. I think that's really critical for regulation. But the other thing I'm really interested in is how do we have, and I know that John Balbos this morning spoke about that, about health inequity and vulnerability. And so now I do think that actually the power of the data and the power of machine learning can really help us in doing that in a very effective manner. So as from an old epidemiology viewpoint or even a statistics viewpoint, what we used to do is say, okay, now we have this analysis and now let's run the analysis by age group or let's run the analysis by gender, or let's analyze it for poor people, right? Well, forget about that because you, you're never gonna have enough comparisons. So what we can do now with causal rule ensemble and machine learning, which by the way, is a field that is very well established, is really now apply that to our national data source and identify the communities that they are in one stream on the other stream. And this community might be characterized by up to a 10 factors or 20 factors like they don't have access to healthcare, they have lack of air conditioning, they are mostly underrepresented in minority, right? So I wanna start for all of the climate change related exposure to really thinking about causality and machine learning to really flag the community that are most affected and what are the factors that are leading to their vulnerability so that in addition to have a national policy, we can contact the local health department and say, okay, your community has all of these features, this aspect that next soda came, it's making the cause, you know, the risk of that that is 10 times higher than someone else, right? So this is something from a data-driven perspective that personally I, I'm really excited and that can be applied for any different type of climate change related exposure, whatever is, you know, hurricane, wildfire, droughts and heat waves or whatever. Thank you for that. That's that's fantastic. And you know, I, I note that um, sometimes the some of the advanced terminology and methodologies in biostatistics, things about you know talking about causal inference and machine learning, can be a little bit opaque to the general audience. But I think you, I want to thank you for making it uh, sort of showing showing the value, sort of the real real world value of that kind of those those advanced methods that you know sound like you know sound like hocus pocus, but actually you know, can really help us solve some of these really important tangible on the ground problems. I'm gonna turn attention now for the last few minutes to some of the audience questions though. There was one clarifying question during your talk about the heat alert uh, work. And I think, I think the question, if I understood it correctly was um, in, the, in the counterfactual scenarios, were you looking at um, just doing more alerts for a, for a given event or was it more alerts over the course of the summer so that more more heat events got got alerted. Was could you just clarify that, that point? The second, the second one. So okay, basically, good. to to have a lower temperature threshold to be able to and 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 so in that framework, what we wanted because you know one question that at the beginning my colleague Kate 
was like, you know, this is the, the heat, uh, uh, heat wave alert to have occurred, have been affected. And the answer is like, not really. Okay, so now the next question is, okay, before we throw away the idea, how many more do we have to, right? And uh, which by the way, the other really, I think a very important element of research that I have not done, and I think we need to do is understanding behavior, right? Because unless we understand and characterize the behavioral responses to this heat warning, we are never really gonna get the full, the full picture. But, but that was really the, the goal of that investigation. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, here's another question that, that came up from uh, one of the one of the guests. Um, I'll just read it uh, so I don't get it wrong. Amazing work. Um, the question is, is the satellite data limited to exposure levels in the US? Or is it allowing global exposure data ascertainment for similar studies in countries that are potentially potentially more vulnerable to cl the climate crisis? And are there databases or consortiums for global monitoring data? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, that's the beauty of the satellite data. The satellite data are available globally. Now, um, and that's why I think, well, it's not that easy in terms of that, you know, you can't just download the data set from the website and then say, okay, now I know what's happening in the global south. But uh, again, is enabled, that's why I think developing the groundwork in understanding how you can leverage, how you can leverage satellite data to get a reasonable estimates of exposure to climate change scenario in the developing country, it's now becoming so important and something that we can do that before we couldn't, right? So we actually are uh, expanding our work in the global south with a, a concrete collaboration in Madagascar and really, um, again, the, the, to me, and as you know, you know, I'm always bragging about data science. That's what I love about data science, because if we can figure out in the continental United States how to leverage satellite images with output of the atmospheric chemistry model, and these two sources of data are available globally to make good estimates of climate change related exposure, then we can quickly scale it to the other country, right? And then of course it will be up to them whether or not they will be able to link to health outcome in their own country. But if, you know, even if you don't link it to health, you can monitor over time, you know, how these climate change related exposure are, are, are developing. So yeah, it's a great question. And I think that is a really another area, I think that um, really fascinating and important and urgent as well. Yeah, very, very, very good point. Um, here's another uh, question. It really gets at sort of data related to vulnerabilities. Um, so the question was, could you elaborate on the best data management or analytical practices for reconciling disparate data like the environmental data with the social and vulnerability data? Uh, and also whether if, if they come at different spatial scales, is that is that an easy process or are there special challenges, especially when you're bringing the vulnerability data into the equation? Yeah, <laughs> is, um, is hard and, and requires expertise from many people. And, and it's also one of these work that unfortunately, and that's what I'm trying to change, is often not re, re, rewarded. And that's why I call it data science, because actually, I have this extremely strong opinion that everything that has intellectual value to me is science. And so reconciling disparate, you know, different data sources from different, from different government agency at different spatial resolution in a way that then produce science to me is an extremely important and valued scientific contribution, right? So first of all, let me say that it's science. Reconciling data is science. Um, now, that's number one. Number two, to do it well, you need expertise in data engineering, in software engineering, in computer science, and actually in geography uh, and in community health-based research, right? So we are doing the best considering the funding that we have, I am really blessed that there are a couple of data engineers in, in my team and a software engineer. And 
you have to make, this is why I consider it an intellectual, it requires intellectual contribution because there is really not a best formula. It requires a lot of decision along the computational pipeline of how you integrate this data. So classical example, the PM 2.5, uh, estimates comes on one kilometer, one kilometer grid because of the satellite image comes on one kilometer, one kilometer grid, right? The place of residence of the Mediterranean Re is a zip code. So how do you go from grid exposure to zip code level exposure? Do you just take the average? You take a population weighted average? What happens if the boundary of the zip code change over time, right? So you make the decision, but that's go back to one of the other principle of reproducibility and making the entire computational pipeline reproducible and available. So then we have to make some decision, right? But then we can make alternative decision and look at the sensitivity of the results and we can make that available. So then you can make different decision and figure out which of the decision that you have made in try to reconcile these different sources of data really matter um, and doesn't matter. And then there is the, the scalability and the immense amount of data. And so I think it's really, you know, this is why I've been trying to also create a community because the, the, the thing that, that I really frustrates me that I don't want to happen is that we reinvent the well, that you have the same postdoctoral fellow, two different postdoctoral fellow going to the same pipeline again, where you just needed to do once. Thank you for that. And thank you for your, um, not only your super stimulating presentation, but also the really interesting responses to all these questions. Um, it, it's been a really, really informative discussion. Um, I'm gonna uh, close this session and turn turn the, the mic over to Dean Galea to close out the conference. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Kenny. Thank you, Pat. Um, you know, there really is probably no issue that's more pressing right now for all of us in population health and climate change. And to have the privilege of listening to Dr. Balbus, Dr. Domenici, and the panel that we had today is really quite remarkable. I, uh, I, I learned a tremendous amount. I do very little of this in my own work, although I had the privilege of working with colleagues who do this kind of work. And uh, I think I emerge impressed both by the fact that uh, of the uh, pressing import of this issue and as well as there are solutions. Um, uh, Dr. Domenici, I think, did a terrific job of talking about the science and uh, showing really how it's the science that underpins everything that the world is learning and can guide us forward, which really is what we do in, um, in uh, universities in academic public health, academic medicine. So I wanna say thank you to all our speakers. I wanna say thank you to Professor Wallenius who has worked uh, for months in setting up this uh, virtual symposium today. And thank you to everybody who um, was with us uh, during uh, this uh, day. I uh, hope everybody found, this, found it as interesting and as stimulating uh, as I did. And most of all, Thank you to everybody for everything you're doing, for being a part of these conversations and uh, for moving the world to a better, healthier place. Everybody, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Have a good evening. Take good care. Thank you.